Section 13 from A Journal of the Plague Year. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dennis Sayers. A Journal of the Plague Year by Daniel Defoe. Section 13. I come back to my three men. Their story has a moral in every part of it, and their whole conduct, and that of some whom they joined with, is a pattern for all poor men to follow, or women either, if ever such a time comes again. And if there was no other end in recording it, I think this a very just one, whether my account be exactly according to fact or no. Two of them are said to be brothers, the one an old soldier, but now a biscuit-maker, the other a lame sailor, but now a sail-maker, the third a joiner. Says John, the biscuit-maker, one day to Thomas, his brother, the sail-maker, Brother Tom, what will become of us? The plague grows hot in the city, and increases this way. What shall we do? Truly, said Thomas, I am at a great loss what to do, for I find, if it comes down into Wapping, I shall be turned out of my lodging. And thus they began to talk of it beforehand. John, turned out of your lodging? Tom, if you are, I don't know who will take you in, for people are so afraid of one another now, there's no getting a lodging anywhere. Thomas, why, the people where I lodge are good, civil people, and have kindness enough for me, too. But they say I go abroad every day to do my work, and it will be dangerous. And they talk of locking themselves up, and letting nobody come near them. John, why, they are in the right, to be sure, if they resolve to venture staying in town. Thomas, nay, I might even resolve to stay within doors too, for except a suit of sails that my master has in hand, and which I am just finishing, I am like to get no more work a great while. There's no trade stirs now. Workmen and servants are turned off everywhere, so that I might be glad to be locked up too. But I do not see they will be willing to consent to that any more than to the other. John, why, what will you do then, brother, and what shall I do? For I am almost as bad as you. The people where I lodge are all gone into the country, but a maid, and she is to go next week, and to shut the house quite up, so that I shall be turned adrift to the wide world before you, and I am resolved to go away too, if I knew but where to go. Thomas, we were both distracted. We did not go away at first. Then we might have travelled anywhere. There's no stirring now. We shall be starved if we pretend to go out of town. They won't let us have victuals, no, not for our money, nor let us come into the towns, much less into their houses. John, and... That which is almost as bad, I have but little money to help myself with neither. Thomas. As to that, we might make shift. I have a little, though not much, but I tell you there's no stirring on the road. I know a couple of poor honest men in our street have attempted to travel, and at Barnet, or Whetstone, or thereabouts, the people offered to fire at them if they pretended to go forward. Oh, so they are come back again quite discouraged. John, I would have ventured their fire if I had been there. If I had been denied food for my money, they should have seen me take it before their faces, and if I had tendered money for it, they could not have taken any course with me by law. Thomas, you talk your old soldier's language as if you were in the low countries now, but this is a serious thing. 
the people have a good reason to keep anybody off that they are not satisfied or sound at such a time as this and we must not plunder them john no brother you mistake the case and mistake me too i would plunder nobody but for any town upon the road to deny me leave to pass through the town in the open highway and deny me provisions for my money is to say the town has a right to starve me to death which cannot be true thomas but they do not deny you liberty to go back again from whence you came and therefore they do not starve you john but the next town behind me will by the same rule deny me leave to go back and so they do starve me between them besides there is no law to prohibit my travelling wherever i will on the road thomas but there will be so much difficulty in disputing with them at every town on the road that it is not for poor men to do it or undertake it at such a time as this is especially john why brother our condition at this rate is worse than anybody else's for we can neither go away nor stay here i am of the same mind with the lepers of samaria if we stay here we are sure to die i mean especially as you and i are stated without a dwelling-house of our own and without lodging in anybody else's there is no lying in the street at such a time as this we had as good go into the dead cart at once therefore i say if we stay here we are sure to die and if we go away we can but die I am resolved to be gone. Thomas, you will go away. Whither you go, and what can you do? I would as willingly go away as you, if I knew whither. But we have no acquaintance, no friends. Here we were born, and here we must die. John, look you, Tom, the whole kingdom is my native country as well as this town. You may as well say, I must not go out of my house, if it is on fire, as that I must not go out of the town I was born in, when it is infected with the plague. I was born in England, and have a right to live in it, if I can. Thomas, but you know, every vagrant person by the laws of England be taken up, and passed back to their last legal settlement. John, but how shall they make me vagrant i desire only to travel on upon my lawful occasions thomas what lawful occasions can we pretend to travel or rather wander upon they will not be put off with words john is not flying to save our lives a lawful occasion and do they not all know that the fact is true we cannot be said to dissemble thomas but suppose they let us pass whither shall we go john anywhere to save our lives it is time enough to consider that when we are got out of this town if i am once out of this dreadful place i care not where i go thomas we shall be driven to great extremities I know not what to think of it. John. Well, Tom, consider of it a little. This was about the beginning of July, and though the plague was come forward in the west and north parts of the town, yet all Wapping, as I have observed before, and Redriff, and Ratcliffe, and Limehouse, and Poplar, in short, Deptford, and Greenwich, all both sides of the river from the hermitage and from over against it quite down to blackwall was entirely free there had not been one person died of the plague in all stepney parish and not one on the south side of whitechapel road no not in any parish and yet the weekly bill was that very week risen up to one thousand six 
It was a fortnight after this before the two brothers met again, and then the case was a little altered, and the plague was exceedingly advanced, and the number greatly increased. The bill was up at 2,785, and prodigiously increasing, though still both sides of the river, as below, kept pretty well. But some began to die in Redriff, and about five or six in Ratcliffe Highway, when the sailmaker came to his brother John, express, and in some fright, for he was absolutely warned out of his lodging, and had only a week to provide himself. His brother John was in as bad a case, for he was quite out, and had only begged leave of his master, the biscuit-maker, to lodge in an outhouse belonging to his workhouse, where he only lay upon straw, with some biscuit-sacks, or bread-sacks, as they called them, laid upon it, and some of the same sacks to cover him. Here they resolved, seeing all employment being at an end, and no work or wages to be had, they would make the best of their way to get out of the reach of the dreadful infection, and being as good husbands as they could, would endeavour to live upon what they had as long as it would last, and then work for more, if they could get work anywhere, of any kind, let it be what it would. While they were considering to put this resolution in practice in the best manner they could, the third man, who was acquainted very well with the sailmaker, came to know of the design, and got leave to be one of the number, and thus they prepared to set out. It happened that they had not an equal share of money, but, as the sailmaker, who had the best stock, was, besides his being lame, the most unfit to expect to get anything by working in the country. So he was content that what money they had should all go into one public stock, on condition that whatever any one of them could gain more than another, it should, without any grudging, be all added to the public stock. They resolved to load themselves with as little baggage as possible, because they resolved at first to travel on foot, and to go a great way, that they might, if possible, be effectually safe. And a great many consultations they had with themselves, before they could agree about what way they should travel, which they were so far from adjusting, that even to the morning they set out, they were not resolved on it. At last the seaman put in a hint that determined it. First, says he, the weather is very hot, and therefore I am for travelling north, that we may not have the sun upon our faces and beating on our breasts, which will heat and suffocate us, and I have been told, says he, that it is not good to overheat our blood at a time when, for aught we know, the infection may be in the very air. In the next place, says he, I am for going the way that may be contrary to the wind, as it may blow when we set out, that we may not have the wind blow the air of the city on our backs as we go. These two cautions were approved of, if it could be brought so to hit that the wind might not be in the south when they set out to go north. John, the baker, who had been a soldier, then put in his opinion. First, says he, we none of us expect to get any lodging on the road, and it will be a little too hard to lie just in the open air. Though it be warm weather, yet it may be wet and damp, and we have a double reason to take care of our healths at such a time as this. And therefore, says he, you, brother Tom, that are a sailmaker, might easily make us a little tent, and I will undertake to set it up every night, and take it down, and a fig for all the inns in England. If we have a good tent over our heads, we shall do well enough. The joiner opposed this, and told them, let them leave that to him, 
he would undertake to build them a house every night with his hatchet and mallet, though he had no other tools, which should be fully to their satisfaction, and as good as a tent. The soldier and the joiner disputed that point some time, but at last the soldier carried it for a tent. The only objection against it was that it must be carried with them, and that would increase their baggage too much, the weather being hot. But the sailmaker had a piece of good hap fell in which made that easy, for his master, whom he worked for, having a rope-walk as well as sail-making trade, had a little poor horse that he made no use of then, and being willing to assist the three honest men, he gave them the horse for the carrying their baggage, also for a small matter of three days' work that his man did for him before he went. He let him have an old top-gallant sail that was worn out, but was sufficient and more than enough to make a very good tent. The soldier showed how to shape it, and they soon by his direction made their tent, and fitted it with poles or staves for the purpose, and thus they were furnished for their journey, viz. three men, one tent, one horse, one gun, for the soldier would not go without arms, for now he said he was no more a biscuit-maker, but a trooper. The joiner had a small bag of tools, such as might be useful if he should get any work abroad, as well as for their subsistence as his own. What money they had, they brought all into one public stock, and thus they began their journey. It seems that in the morning, when they set out, the wind blew, as the sailor said, by his pocket compass, at northwest by west. So they directed, or rather resolved to direct, their course northwest. But then a difficulty came in their way, that, as they set out from the hither end of Wapping, near the Hermitage, and that the plague was now very violent, especially on the north side of the city, as in Shoreditch and Cripplegate Parish, they did not think it safe for them to go near those parts, so they went away east, through Ratcliffe Highway, as far as Ratcliffe Cross, and leaving Stepney Church still on their left hand, being afraid to come up from Ratcliffe Cross to Mile End, because they must come just by the churchyard, and because the wind, that seemed to blow more from the west, blew directly from the side of the city where the plague was hottest. So, I say, leaving Stepney, they fetched a long compass, and going to Poplar and Bromley, came into the great road, just at Bow. Here the watch placed upon Bow Bridge would have questioned them, but they crossed the road into a narrow way that turns out of the hither end of the town of Bow to Old Ford, avoided any inquiry there, and travelled to Old Ford. The constables everywhere were upon their guard not so much, it seems, to stop people passing by as to stop them from taking up their abode in their towns, and withal because of a report that was newly raised at the time, and that, indeed, was not very improbable, viz., that the poor people in London, being distressed and starved for want of work, and by that means for want of bread, were up in arms, and had raised a tumult, and that they would come out to all the towns round to plunder for bread. This, I say, was only a rumour, and it was very well it was no more but it was not so far off from being a reality as it has been thought, for in a few weeks more the poor people became so desperate by the calamity they suffered that they were with great difficulty kept from going out into the fields and towns and tearing all in pieces wherever they came, and, as I have observed before, nothing hindered them 
but that the plague raged so violently and fell in upon them so furiously that they rather went to the grave by thousands than into the fields in mobs by thousands for in the parts about the parishes of st sepulchre clarkenwell cripplegate bishopsgate and shoreditch which were the places where the mob began to threaten the distemper came on so furiously that there died in those few parishes even then before the plague was come to its height no less than five thousand three hundred and sixty-one people in the first three weeks in august when at the same time the parts about wapping radcliffe and rotherhithe were as before described hardly touched or but very lightly so that in a word though as i have said before the good management of the lord mayor and justices did much to prevent the rage and desperation of the people from breaking out in rabbles and tumults and in short from the poor plundering the rich i say though they did much the dead carts did more for as i have said that in five parishes only there died above five thousand in twenty days so there might be probably three times that number sick all that time for some recovered and great numbers fell sick every day and died afterwards besides i must still be allowed to say that if the bills of mortality said five thousand i always believed it was near twice as many in reality there being no room to believe that the account they gave was right or that indeed they were among such confusions as i saw them in in any condition to keep an exact account but to return to my travellers here they were only examined and as they seemed rather coming from the country than from the city they found the people the easier with them that they talked to them let them come into a public house where the constable and his warders were and gave them drink and some victuals which greatly refreshed and encouraged them and here it came into their heads to say when they should be inquired of afterwards not that they came from london but that they came out of essex to forward this little fraud they obtained so much favour of the constable at old ford as to give them a certificate of their passing from essex through that village and that they had not been in london which though false in the common acceptance of london in the country yet was literally true wapping or radcliffe being no part either of the city or liberty this certificate directed to the constable that was at homerton one of the hamlets of the parish of hackney was so serviceable to them that it procured them not a free passage there only but a full certificate of health from a justice of the peace who upon the constable's application granted it without much difficulty and thus they passed through the long divided town of hackney for it lay then in several separated hamlets and travelled on till they came into the great north road on the top of stamford hill by this time they began to be weary and so in the back road from hackney a little before it opened into the said great road they resolved to set up their tent and encamp for the first night which they did accordingly with this addition that finding a barn or a building like a barn and first searching as well as they could to be sure there was nobody in it they set up their tent with the head of it against the barn this they did also because the wind blew that night very high and they were but young at such a way of lodging as well as the managing their tent here they went to sleep but the joiner a grave and sober man and not pleased with their lying at this loose rate the first night 
could not sleep, and resolved, after trying to sleep to no purpose, that he would get out, and, taking the gun in his hand, stand sentinel and guard his companions. So, with the gun in his hand, he walked to and again before the barn, for that stood in the field near the road, but within the hedge. He had not been long upon the scout, but he heard a noise of people coming on, as if it had been a great number, and they came on, as he thought, directly towards the barn. He did not presently awake his companions, but in a few minutes more, their noise growing louder and louder, the biscuit-baker called to him and asked him what was the matter, and quickly started out, too. The other, being the lame sailmaker and most weary, lay still in the tent. As they expected, so the people whom they had heard come on directly to the barn, when one of our travellers challenged, like soldiers upon the guard, with, Who comes there? The people did not answer immediately, but one of them speaking to another that was behind him. Alas! alas we are all disappointed says he here are some people before us the barn is taken up they all stopped upon that as under some surprise and it seems that there was about thirteen of them in all and some women among them they consulted together what they should do and by their discourse our travellers soon found they were poor distressed people too, like themselves, seeking shelter and safety, and besides our travellers had no need to be afraid of their coming up to disturb them, for as soon as they heard the words, Who comes there? these could hear the women say, as if frighted, Do not go near them, how do you know but that they may have the plague? And when one of the men said, Let us but speak to them, the women said, No, don't by any means. We have escaped thus far by the goodness of God. Do not let us run into danger now, we beseech you. Our travellers found by this that they were a good, sober sort of people, and flying for their lives, as they were. And, as they were encouraged by it, so John said to the joiner, his comrade, Let us encourage them, too, as much as we can. So he called to them, Hark ye, good people, says the joiner, We find by your talk that you are flying from the same dreadful enemy as we are. Do not be afraid of us. We are only three poor men of us. If you are free from the distemper, you shall not be hurt by us. We are not in the barn, but in a little tent, here in the outside, and we will remove for you. We can set up our tent again immediately anywhere else. And upon this a parley began between the joiner, whose name was Richard, and one of their men, who said his name was Ford. Ford, and do you assure us that you are all sound men? Richard, nay, we are concerned to tell you of it, that you may not be uneasy, or think yourselves in danger, but you see we do not desire you should put yourself into any danger, and therefore I tell you that we have not made use of the barn, so we will remove from it, that you may be safe, and we also. Ford, that is very kind and charitable. But if we have reason to be satisfied that you are sound and free from the visitation, why should we make you remove now? You are settled in your lodging, and it may be are laid down to rest. We will go into the barn, if you please, to rest ourselves a while, and we need not disturb you. Richard, well, but you are more than we are. I hope you will assure us that you are all of you sound too, for the danger is as great from you to us as from us to you. Ford, blessed be God that some do escape, though it is but few. What may be our portion still we know not, 
but hitherto we are preserved. Richard, what part of the town do you come from? Was the plague come to the places where you lived? Ford, I, I in a most frightful and terrible manner, or else we had not fled away as we do, but we believe there will be very few alive behind us. Richard, what part do you come from? Ford, we are most of us of Cripplegate Parish, only two or three of Clerkenwell Parish, but on the hither side. Richard, how then was it that you came away no sooner? Ford, we have been away some time, and kept together as well as we could at the hither end of Islington, where we got leave to lie in an old unabandoned house, and had some bedding and conveniences of our own that we brought with us. But the plague is come up into Islington, too, and a house next door to our poor dwelling was infected and shut up, and we are come away in a fright. Richard, and what way are you going? Ford, as our lot shall cast us, we know not whither, but God will guide those that look up to him. They parleyed no further at that time, but came all up to the barn, and with some difficulty got into it. There was nothing but hay in the barn, but it was almost full of that, and they accommodated themselves as well as they could and went to rest. But our travellers observed that, before they went to sleep, an ancient man, who it seems was father of one of the women, went to prayer with all the company, recommending themselves to the blessing and direction of Providence, before they went to sleep. End of Section 13 14. Of A Journal of the Plague Year. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dennis Sayers. A Journal of the Plague Year by Daniel Defoe. Section 14. It was soon day at that time of the year, and as Richard the joiner had kept guard the first part of the night, so John the soldier relieved him, and he had the post in the morning, and they began to be acquainted with one another. It seems when they left Islington they intended to have gone north away to Highgate, but were stopped at Holloway, and there they would not let them pass. So they crossed over the fields and hills to the eastward, and came out at the boarded river, and so, avoiding the towns, they left Hornsey on the left, and Newington on the right, and came into the great road about Stamford Hill on that side, as the three travellers had done on the other side, and now they had thoughts of going over the river and the marshes, and make forwards to Epping Forest, where they hoped they should get leave to rest. It seems they were not poor, at least not so poor as to be in want, at least they had enough to subsist them moderately for two or three months, when, as they said, they were in hopes the cold weather would check the infection, or at least the violence of it would have spent itself, and would abate, if it were only for want of people left alive, to be infected. This was much the fate of our three travellers, only that they seemed to be the better furnished for travelling, and had it in their view to go farther off, for, as to the first, they did not propose to go farther than one day's journey, 
that so they might have intelligence every two or three days how things were at london but here our travellers found themselves under an unexpected inconvenience namely that of their horse for by means of the horse to carry their baggage they were obliged to keep in the road whereas the people of this other band went over the fields or roads path or no path way or no way as they pleased neither had they any occasion to pass through any town or come near any town other than to buy such things as they wanted for their necessary subsistence and in that indeed they were put to much difficulty of which in its place but our three travellers were obliged to keep the road or else they must commit spoil and do the country a great deal of damage in breaking down fences and gates to go over enclosed fields which they were loath to do if they could help it our three travellers however had a great mind to join themselves to this company and take their lot with them and after some discourse they laid aside their first design which looked northward and resolved to follow the other into essex so in the morning they took up their tent and loaded their horse and away they travelled all together they had some difficulty in passing the ferry at the riverside the ferryman being afraid of them but after some parley at a distance the ferryman was content to bring his boat to a place distant from the usual ferry and leave it there for them to take it so putting themselves over he directed them to leave the boat and he having another boat said he would fetch it again which it seems however he did not do for above eight days here giving the ferryman money beforehand they had a supply of victuals and drink which he brought and left in the boat for them but not without as i said having received the money beforehand but now our travellers were at a great loss and difficulty how to get the horse over the boat being small and not fit for it and at last could not do it without unloading the baggage and making him swim over from the river they travelled towards the forest but when they came to walthamstow the people of that town denied to admit them as was the case everywhere the constables and their watchmen kept them off at a distance and parleyed with them they gave the same account of themselves as before but these gave no credit to what they said giving it for a reason that two or three companies had already come that way and made the like pretenses but that they had given several people the distemper in the towns where they had passed and had been afterwards so hardly used by the country though with justice too as they had deserved that about brentwood or that way several of them perished in the fields whether of the plague or of mere want and distress they could not tell this was a good reason indeed why the people of walthamstow should be very cautious and why they should resolve not to entertain anybody that they were not well satisfied of but as richard the joiner and one of the other men who parleyed with them told them it was no reason why they should block up the roads and refuse to let people pass through the town and who asked nothing of them but to go through the street that if their people were afraid of them they might go into their houses and shut their doors 
they would neither show them civility or incivility, but go on about their business. The constables and attendants, not to be persuaded by reason, continued obstinate, and would hearken to nothing. So the two men that talked with them went back to their fellows to consult what was to be done. It was very discouraging in the whole, and they knew not what to do for a good while. But at last John, the soldier and biscuit-maker, considering a while, Come, says he, leave the rest of the parley to me. He had not appeared yet, so he sets the joiner, Richard, to work to cut some poles out of the trees, and shape them as like guns as he could. And in a little time he had five or six fair muskets, which at a distance would not be known. And about the part where the lock of a gun is, he caused them to wrap cloth and rags, such as they had, as soldiers do in wet weather, to preserve the locks on their pieces from rust. The rest was discolored with clay or mud, such as they could get, and all this while the rest of them sat under the trees, by his direction, in two or three bodies, where they made fires at a good distance from one another. While this was doing, he advanced himself, and two or three with him, and set up their tent in the lane within sight of the barrier which the townsmen had made, and set a sentinel just by it, with the real gun, the only one they had, and who walked to and fro with the gun on his shoulder, so that the people of the town might see him. Also, he tied the horse to a gate in the hedge just by, and got some dry sticks together, and kindled a fire on the other side of the tent, so that the people of the town could see the fire and the smoke, but could not see what they were doing at it. After the country people had looked upon them very earnestly a great while, and by all that they could see, could not but suppose that they were a great many in company. They began to be uneasy, not for their going away, but for staying where they were, and above all, perceiving they had horses and arms, for they had seen one horse and one gun at the tent, they had seen others of them walk about the field on the inside of the hedge, by the side of the lane, with their muskets, as they took them to be, shouldered. I say, upon such a sight as this, you may be assured they were alarmed and terribly frighted, and it seems they went to a justice of the peace to know what they should do. What the justice advised them to, I know not, but towards the evening they called from the barrier, as above, to the sentinel at the tent. What do you want? says John. Note. It seems John was in the tent, but hearing them call, he steps out, and taking the gun upon his shoulder, talked to them as if he had been the sentinel placed there upon the guard by some officer that was his superior. Footnote in the original. Why, what do you intend to do, says the constable? To do, says John, what would you have us to do? Constable, why don't you be gone? What do you stand there for? John, why do you stop us in the king's highway and pretend to refuse us leave to go on our way? Constable, we are not bound to tell you our reason, though we did let you know it was because of the plague. John, we told you we were all sound and free from the plague, 
which we were not bound to have satisfied you of, and yet you pretend to stop us on the highway. Constable, we have a right to stop it up, and our own safety obliges us to it. Besides, this is not the king's highway, tis a way upon sufferance. You see here is a gate, and if we do let people pass here, we make them pay toll. John, we have a right to seek our own safety as well as you, and you may see we are flying for our lives, and tis very unchristian and unjust to stop us. Constable, you may go back from whence you came. We do not hinder you from that. John, no, it is a stronger enemy than you that keeps us from doing that, or else we should not have come hither. Constable, well, you may go any other way then. John, no, no. I suppose you see we are able to send you going, and all the people of your parish, and come through your town when we will. But since you have stopped us here, we are content. You see, we have encamped here, and here we will live. We hope you will furnish us with victuals. Constable, we furnish you what mean you by that? John, why, you would not have us starve, would you? If you stop us here, you must keep us. You will be ill-kept at our maintenance. John, if you stent us, we shall make ourselves the better allowance. Constable, why? You will not pretend to quarter upon us by force, will you? John, we have offered no violence to you, yet. Why do you seem to oblige us to it? I am an old soldier, and cannot starve. And if you think that we shall be obliged to go back for want of provisions, you are mistaken. Constable, since you threaten us, we shall take care to be strong enough for you. I have orders to raise the county upon you. John, it is you that threaten, not we. And since you are for mischief, you cannot blame us if we do not give you time for it. We shall begin our march in a few minutes constable what is it you demand of us john at first we desired nothing of you but leave to go through the town we should have offered no injury to any of you neither would you have had any injury or loss by us we are not thieves but poor people in distress and flying from the dreadful plague in London, which devours thousands every week. We wonder how you could be so unmerciful. Constable. Self-preservation obliges us. John. What? To shut up your compassion in a case of such distress as this? Constable. Well, if you will pass over the fields on your left hand and behind that part of the town, I will endeavor to have gates opened for you. John, our horsemen cannot pass with our baggage that way. Note, they had but one horse among them. Footnotes in the original. The way does not lead into the road that we want to go, and why should you force us out of the road? Besides, you have kept us here all day, without any provisions, but such as we brought with us. I think you ought to send us some provisions for our relief. 
constable. If you will go another way, we will send you some provisions. John, that is the way, to have all the towns in the county stop up the ways against us. Constable, if they all furnish you with food, what will you be the worse? I see you have tents. You want no lodging. John, well, what quantity of provisions will you send us? Constable, how many are you? John, nay, we do not ask enough for all our company. We are in three companies. If you will send us bread for twenty men, and about six or seven women for three days, and show us the way over the field you speak of, we desire not to put your people into any fear for us. We will go out of our way to oblige you, though we are as free from infection as you are. Note. Here he called to one of his men, and bade him order Captain Richard and his people to march the lower way on the side of the marches, and meet them in the forest, which was all a sham, for they had no Captain Richard, or any such company. Footnote in the original. Constable. And will you assure us that your other people shall offer us no new disturbance? John. No, no, you may depend on it. Constable. You must oblige yourself, too, that none of your people shall come a step nearer than where the provisions we send you shall be set down. John. I answer for it, we will not. Accordingly, they sent to the place twenty loaves of bread, and three or four large pieces of good beef, and opened some gates through which they passed. But none of them had courage so much as to look out to see them go, and as it was evening, if they had looked, they could not have seen them, as to know how few they were. This was John, the soldier's management. But this gave such an alarm to the county, that had they really been two or three hundred, the whole county would have been raised upon them, and they would have been sent to prison, or perhaps knocked on the head. They were soon made sensible of this, for two days afterwards they found several parties of horsemen and footmen also about in pursuit of three companies of men armed as they said with muskets who were broke out from london and had the plague upon them and that were not only spreading the distemper among the people but plundering the country as they saw now the consequence of their case they soon saw the danger they were in so they resolved, by the advice also of the old soldier, to divide themselves again. John and his two comrades with the horse went away, as if towards Waltham, the other in two companies, but all a little asunder, went towards Epping. The first night they encamped all in the forest, and not far off of one another, but not setting up the tent, lest that should discover them. On the other hand, Richard went to work with his axe and his hatchet, and cutting down branches of trees, he built three tents, or hovels, in which they all encamped with as much convenience as they could expect. The provisions they had at Walthamstow served them very plentifully this night, and as for the next, they left it to Providence. They had fared so well with the old soldier's conduct that they now willingly made him their leader, and the first of his conduct appeared to be very good. 
he told them that they were now at a proper distance enough from london that as they need not be immediately beholden to the country for relief so they ought to be as careful the country did not infect them as that they did not infect the country that what little money they had they must be as frugal of as they could that as he would not have them think of offering the country any violence so they must endeavour to make the sense of their condition go as far with the country as it could they all referred themselves to his direction so they left their three houses standing and the next day went away towards epping the captain also for now they so called him and his two fellow travellers laid aside their design of going to waltham and all went together when they came near epping they halted choosing out a proper place in the open forest not very near the highway but not far out of it on the north side under a little cluster of low pollard trees here they pitched their little camp which consisted of three large tents or huts made of poles which their carpenter and such as were his assistants cut down and fixed in the ground in a circle binding all the small ends together at the top and thickening the sides with boughs of trees and bushes so that they were completely close and warm they had besides this a little tent where the women lay by themselves and a hut to put the horse in it happened that the next day or next but one was market day at epping when captain john and one of the other men went to market and bought some provisions that is to say bread and some mutton and beef and two other women went separately as if they had not belonged to the rest and bought more john took the horse to bring it home and the sack which the carpenter carried his tools in to put it in the carpenter went to work and made them benches and stools to sit on such as the wood he could get would afford and a kind of table to dine on they were taken no notice of for two or three days but after that abundance of people ran out of the town to look at them and all the country was alarmed about them the people at first seemed afraid to come near them and on the other hand they desired the people to keep off for there was a rumour that the plague was at waltham and that it had been in epping two or three days so john called out to them not to come to them for says he we are all whole and sound people here and we would not have you bring the plague among us nor pretend we brought it among you after this the parish officers came up to them and parlayed with them at a distance and desired to know who they were and by what authority they pretended to fix their stand at that place john answered very frankly they were poor distressed people from london who foreseeing the misery they should be reduced to if plague spread into the city had fled out in time for their lives and having no acquaintance or relations to fly to had first taken up at islington but the plague being come into that town were fled farther and as they supposed that the people of epping might have refused them coming into their town they had pitched their tents thus in the open field and in the forest being willing to bear all the hardships of such a disconsolate lodging rather than have any one think or be afraid that they should receive injury by them 
At first the Epping people talked roughly to them, and told them they must remove, that this was no place for them, and that they pretended to be sound and well, but that they might be infected with the plague for aught they knew, and might infect the whole country, and they could not suffer them here. John argued very calmly with them a great while, and told them that London was the place by which they, that is, the townsmen of Epping and all the country round them, subsisted to whom they sold the produce of their lands, and out of whom they made their rent of their farms, and to be so cruel to the inhabitants of London, or to any of those by whom they gained so much, was very hard, and they would be loath to have it remembered hereafter, and have it told how barbarous, how inhospitable, and how unkind they were to the people of London when they fled from the face of the most horrible enemy in the world, that it would be enough to make the name of an Epping man hateful through all the city, and to have the rabble stone them in the very streets whenever they came so much as to market that they were not yet secure from being visited themselves, and that, as he heard, Waltham was already, that they would think it very hard that when any of them fled for fear before they were touched, they should be denied the liberty of lying so much as in the open fields. The Epping men told them again that they indeed said they were sound and free from the infection, but that they saw no assurance of it, and that it was reported that there had been a great rabble of people at Walthamstow, who made such pretenses of being sound as they did, but that they threatened to plunder the town and force their way, whether the parish officers would or no, that there were near two hundred of them, and had arms and tents like low country soldiers, that they extorted provisions from the town by threatening them with living upon them at free quarter, showing their arms and talking in the language of soldiers, and that several of them had gone away toward Rumford and Brentwood, the country had been infected by them, and the plague spread into both those large towns, so that the people durst not go to market there as usual, that it was very likely that they were some of that party, and if so they deserved to be sent to the county jail, and be secured till they had made satisfaction for the damage they had done and for the terror and the fright they had put the country into. John answered that what other people had done was nothing to them, that they assured them they were all of one company, that they had never been more in number than they saw them at that time, which, by the way, was very true that they came out in two separate companies, but joined by the way, their cases being the same, that they were ready to give what account of themselves anybody would desire of them, and to give in their names and places of abode, that so they might be called to an account for any disorder that they might be guilty of, that the townsmen might see they were content to live hardly, and only desired a little room to breathe in, on the forest where it was wholesome, for where it was not they could not stay, and would decamp if they found it otherwise there. But, said the townsmen, we have a great charge of poor upon our hands already and we must take care not to increase it. 
we suppose you can give us no security against your being chargeable to our parish and to the inhabitants any more than you can of being dangerous to us as to the infection why look you says john as to being chargeable to you we hope we shall not if you will relieve us with provisions for our present necessity we will be very thankful as we all lived without charity when we were at home so we will oblige ourselves fully to repay you if god pleases to bring us back to our own families and houses in safety and to restore health to the people of london as to our dying here we assure you if any of us die we that survive will bury them and put you to no expense except it should be that we should all die and then indeed the last man not being able to bury himself would put you to that single expense which i am persuaded says john he would leave enough behind him to pay you for the expense of on the other hand says john if you shut up all bowels of compassion and not relieve us at all we shall not extort anything by violence or steal from any one but when what little we have is spent if we perish for want god's will be done john wrought so upon the townsmen by talking thus rationally and smoothly to them that they went away and though they did not give any consent to their staying there yet they did not molest them and the poor people continued there three or four days longer without any disturbance in this time they had got some remote acquaintance with a victualling house at the outskirts of the town to whom they called at a distance to bring some little things that they wanted and which they caused to be set down at a distance and always paid for very honestly end of section 14from a journal of the plague year this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information visit librivox.org read by dennis sayers a journal of the plague year by daniel defoe section 15 during this time the younger people of the town came frequently pretty near them and would stand and look at them and sometimes talk with them at some space between and particularly it was observed that the first sabbath day the poor people kept retired worshipped god together and were heard to sing psalms these things and a quiet inoffensive behaviour began to get them the good opinion of the country and people began to pity them and speak very well of them the consequence of which was that upon the occasion of a very wet rainy night a certain gentleman who lived in the neighbourhood sent them a little cart with twelve trusses or bundles of straw as well for them to lodge upon as to cover and thatch their huts and to keep them dry the minister of a parish not far off not knowing of the other sent them also about two bushels of wheat and half a bushel of white peas they were very thankful to be sure for this relief and particularly the straw was a very great comfort to them 
for though the ingenious carpenter had made frames for them to lie in like troughs, and filled them with leaves of trees and such things as they could get, and had cut all their tent-cloth out to make them coverlids, yet they lay damp and hard and unwholesome till this straw came, which was to them like feather beds, and, as John said, more welcome than feather beds would have been at another time. This gentleman, and the minister having thus begun, and given an example of charity to these wanderers, others quickly followed, and they received every day some benevolence or other from the people, but chiefly from the gentlemen who dwelt in the country around them. Some sent them chairs, stools, tables, and such household things as they gave notice they wanted. Some sent them blankets, rugs, and coverlids, some earthenware, and some kitchenware for ordering their food. Encouraged by this good usage, their carpenter in a few days built them a large shed or house with rafters, and a roof in form, and an upper floor in which they lodged warm, for the weather began to be damp and cold at the beginning of September. But this house, being well thatched, and the sides and roof made very thick, kept out the cold well enough. He made also an earthen wall at one end with a chimney in it, and another of the company, with a vast deal of trouble and pains, made a funnel to the chimney to carry out the smoke. Here they lived comfortably, though coarsely, till the beginning of September, when they had the bad news to hear, whether true or not, that the plague, which was very hot at Waltham Abbey on one side, and at Rumford and Brentwood on the other side, was also coming to Epping, to Woodford, and to most of the towns upon the forest, and which, as they said, was brought down among them chiefly by the Higglers, and such people as went to and from London with provisions. If this was true, it was an evident contradiction to that report, which was afterwards spread all over England, but which, as I have said, I cannot confirm of my own knowledge, namely, that the market people carrying provisions to the city never got the infection or carried it back into the country, both which, I have been assured, has been false. It might be that they were preserved even beyond expectation, though not to a miracle, that abundance went and came, and were not touched, and that was much for the encouragement of the poor people of London, who had been completely miserable if the people that brought provisions to the markets had not been many times wonderfully preserved, or at least more preserved than would be reasonably expected. But now these new inmates began to be disturbed more effectually, for the towns about them were really infected, and they began to be afraid to trust one another so much as to go abroad for such things as they wanted, and this pinched them very hard for now they had little or nothing but what the charitable gentlemen of the country supplied them with. But, for their encouragement, it happened that other gentlemen in the country, who had not sent them anything before, began to hear of them, and supply them, and one sent them a large pig, that is to say, a porker, another two sheep, and another sent them a calf, in short, they had meat enough, and sometimes had cheese and milk, and all such things. They were chiefly put to it for bread, for when the gentlemen sent them corn, they had nowhere to bake it or grind it. This made them eat the first two bushels of wheat that was sent them in parched corn, as the Israelites of old did, without grinding or making bread of it. At last they found means to carry their corn to a windmill near Woodford, where they had it ground, 
and afterwards the biscuit-maker made a hearth so hollow and dry that he could bake biscuit-cakes tolerably well, and thus they came into a condition to live without any assistance or supplies from the towns, and it was well they did, for the country was soon after fully infected, and about one hundred and twenty were said to have died of the distemper in the villages near them, which was a terrible thing to them. Of this they called a new council, and now the towns had no need to be afraid they should settle near them, but on the contrary several families of the poorer sort of the inhabitants quitted their houses and built huts in the forest after the same manner as they had done but it was observed that several of these poor people that had so removed had the sickness even in their huts or booths the reason of which was plain namely not because they removed into the air but first because they did not remove time enough that is to say not till by openly conversing with the other people their neighbours they had the distemper upon them or as may be said among them and so carried it about them whither they went or second because they were not careful enough after they were safely removed out of the towns not to come in again and mingle with the diseased people but be it which of these it will when our travellers began to perceive that the plague was not only in the towns but even in the tents and huts on the forest near them they began then not only to be afraid but to think of decamping and removing for had they stayed they would have been in manifest danger of their lives it is not to be wondered that they were greatly afflicted at being obliged to quit the place where they had been so kindly received, and where they had been treated with so much humanity and charity, but necessity and the hazard of life, which they came out so far to preserve, prevailed with them, and they saw no remedy. John, however, thought of a remedy for their present misfortune, namely that he would first acquaint that gentleman who was their principal benefactor with the distress they were in and to crave his assistance and advice the good charitable gentleman encouraged them to quit the place for fear they should be cut off from any retreat at all by the violence of the distemper but whither should they go that he found very hard to direct them to at last john asked of him whether he being a justice of the peace would give them certificates of health to other justices whom they might come before that so whatever might be their lot they might not be repulsed now they had been so long from london this his worship immediately granted and gave them proper letters of health and from thence they were at liberty to travel whither they pleased. Accordingly, they had a full certificate of health, intimating that they had resided in a village in the county of Essex so long, that being examined and scrutinized sufficiently, and having been retired from all conversation for above forty days, without any appearance of sickness, they were therefore certainly concluded to be sound men, and might be safely entertained anywhere, having at last removed, rather for the fear of the plague, which was come into such a town, rather than for having any signal of infection upon them, or upon any belonging to them. With this certificate they removed, though with great reluctance, and John, inclining not to go far from home, they moved towards the marshes on the side of Waltham. But here they found a man who, it seems, kept a weir, or stop, upon the river, made to raise the water for the barges which go up and down the river. And he terrified them with dismal stories of the sickness having been spread into all the towns on the river, 
and near the river, on the side of Middlesex and Hertfordshire, that is to say, into Waltham, Waltham Cross, Enfield, and Ware, and all the towns on the road, that they were afraid to go that way, though it seems the man imposed upon them, for that the thing was not really true. However, it terrified them, and they resolved to move across the forest towards Rumford and Brentwood, but they heard that there were numbers of people fled out of London that way, who lay up and down in the forest called Hanelt Forest, reaching near Rumford, and who, having no subsistence or habitation, not only lived oddly, and suffered great extremities in the woods and fields for want of relief, but were said to be made so desperate by those extremities, as they had offered many violences to the county, robbed and plundered and killed cattle, and the like, that others, building huts and hovels by the roadside, begged, and that with an importunity next door to demanding relief, so that the county was very uneasy, and had been obliged to take some of them up. This, in the first place, intimated to them that they would be sure to find the charity and kindness of the county, which they had found here, where they were before, hardened and shut up against them, and that, on the other hand, they would be questioned wherever they came, and would be in danger of violence from others, in like cases as themselves. Upon all these considerations, John, their captain, in all their names, went back to their good friend and benefactor, who had relieved them before, and laying their case truly before him, humbly asked his advice. And he as kindly advised them to take up their old quarters again, or, if not, to remove but a little farther out of the road, and directed them to a proper place for them. And as they really wanted some house, rather than huts, to shelter them at that time of the year, it growing on towards Michaelmas, they found an old decayed house, which had been formerly some cottage, or little habitation, but was so out of repair as scarcely habitable, and by the consent of a farmer, to whose farm it belonged, they got leave to make what use of it they could. The ingenious joiner, and all the rest, by his direction, went to work with it, and in a very few days made it capable to shelter them all in case of bad weather, and in which there was an old chimney and old oven, though both lying in ruins. Yet they made them both fit for use, and raising additions, sheds and lean-tos on every side, they soon made the house capable to hold them all. They chiefly wanted boards to make window-shutters, floors, doors, and several other things, but as the gentlemen above favoured them, and the country was by that means made easy with them, and above all, that they were known to be all sound and in good health, everybody helped them with what they could spare. Here they encamped for good and all, and resolved to remove no more. They saw plainly how terribly alarmed that county was everywhere at anybody that came from London, and that they should have no admittance anywhere but with the utmost difficulty, at least no friendly reception and assistance as they had received here. Now, Although they received great assistance and encouragement from the country gentlemen, and from the people round about them, yet they were put to great straits, for the weather grew cold and wet in October and November, and they had not been used to so much hardship, so that they got colds in their limbs and distempers, but never had the infection, and thus about December they came home to the city again. I give this story thus at large, 
principally to give an account what became of the great numbers of people which immediately appeared in the city as soon as the sickness abated for as i have said great numbers of those that were able and had retreats in the country fled to those retreats so when it was increased to such a frightful extremity as i have related the middling people who had not friends fled to all parts of the country where they could get shelter as well those that had money to relieve themselves as those that had not those that had money always fled farthest because they were able to subsist themselves but those who were empty suffered as i have said great hardships and were often driven by necessity to relieve their wants at the expense of the country by that means the country was made very uneasy at them and sometimes took them though even then they scarce knew what to do with them and were always very backward to punish them but often too they forced them from place to place till they were obliged to come back again to london i have since my knowing this history of john and his brother inquired and found that there were a great many of the poor disconsolate people as above fled into the country every way and some of them got little sheds and barns and outhouses to live in where they could obtain so much kindness of the country and especially where they had any the least satisfactory account to give of themselves and particularly that they were not come out of london too late but others and that in great numbers built themselves little huts and retreats in the fields and woods and lived like hermits in holes and caves or any place they could find and where we may be sure they suffered great extremities such that many of them were obliged to come back again whatever the danger was and so these little huts were often found empty and the country people supposed the inhabitants lay dead in them of the plague and would not go near them for fear no not in a great while nor is it unlikely but that some of the unhappy wanderers might die so all alone even sometimes for want of help as particularly in one tent or hut was found a man dead and on the gate of a field just by was cut with his knife in uneven letters the following words by which it may be supposed the other man escaped or that one dying first the other buried him as well as he could. O oh, misery, we both shall die. Woe, woe! I have given an account already of what I found to have been the case down the river among the seafaring men, how the ships lay in the offing, as it's called, in rows or lines astern of one another, quite down from the pool as far as i could see i have been told that they lay in the same manner quite down the river as low as gravesend and some far beyond even everywhere or in every place where they could ride with safety as to the wind and weather nor did i ever hear that the plague reached to any of the people on board these ships except such as lay up in the pool or as high as deptford reach although the people went frequently on shore to the country towns and villages and farmers houses to buy fresh provisions fowls pigs calves and the like for their supply likewise i found that the watermen on the river above the bridge found means to convey themselves away up the river as far as they could go and that they had many of them their whole families in their boats covered with tilts and bales as they called them and furnished with straw within for their lodging and that they lay thus all along by the shore in the marshes 
and some of them setting up little tents with their sails, and so lying under them on shore in the day, and going into their boats at night. And in this manner, as I have heard, the river sides were lined with boats and people as long as they had anything to subsist on, or could get anything of the country, and indeed the country people, as well gentlemen as others, on these and all other occasions, were very forward to relieve them, but they were by no means willing to receive them into their towns and houses, and for that we cannot blame them. There was one unhappy citizen, within my knowledge, who had been visited in a dreadful manner, so that his wife and all his children were dead, and himself and two servants only left, with an elderly woman, a near relation, who had nursed those that were dead as well as she could. This disconsolate man goes to a village near the town, though not within the bills of mortality, and finding an empty house there, inquires out the owner, and took the house. After a few days he got a cart and loaded it with goods, and carries them down to the house. The people of the village opposed his driving the cart along. But with some arguings and some force, the men that drove the cart along got through the street up to the door of the house. There the constable resisted them again, and would not let them be brought in. The man caused his goods to be unloaden, and laid at the door, and sent the cart away, upon which they carried the man before a justice of the peace. That is to say, they commanded him to go, which he did. The justice ordered him to cause the cart to fetch away the goods again, which he refused to do, upon which the justice ordered the constable to pursue the carters and fetch them back, and make them reload the goods and carry them away, or to set them in the stocks till they came for further orders. And if they could not find them, nor the man would not consent to take them away, they should cause them to be drawn with hooks from the house door and burned in the street. The poor distressed man upon this fetched the goods again, but with grievous cries and lamentations at the hardship of his case. But there was no remedy. Self-preservation obliged the people to those severities which they would not otherwise have been concerned in. Whether this poor man lived or died, I cannot tell, but it was reported that he had the plague upon him at that time, and perhaps the people might report that to justify their usage of him, but it was not unlikely that either he or his goods, or both, were dangerous, when his whole family had been dead of the distempers so little a while before. End of section 15「From a Journal of the Plague Year. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dennis Sayers. A Journal of the Plague Year by Daniel Defoe. Section 16. I know that the inhabitants of the towns adjacent to London were much blamed for cruelty to the poor people that ran from the contagion in their distress, and many very severe things were done, as may be seen from what has been said. But I cannot but say also that, where there was room for charity and assistance to the people, without apparent danger to themselves, they were willing enough to help and relieve them. But as every town were indeed judges in their own case, so the poor people who ran abroad in their extremities were often ill-used and driven back again into the town, and this caused infinite exclamations and outcries against the country towns, and made the clamour 
very popular. And yet, more or less, maugre all the caution, there was not a town of any note within ten, or I believe twenty miles of the city, but what was more or less infected, and had some died among them. I have heard the accounts of several, such as they were reckoned up, as follows. In Enfield, thirty-two. In Hornsey, fifty-eight. Newington, seventeen. Tottenham, forty-two. Edmonton, nineteen. Barnet and Hadley, nineteen. St. Albans, one hundred twenty-one. Watford, forty-five. Eltham and Lussum, eighty-five. Croydon, sixty-one. Brentwood, seventy. Rumford, one hundred and nine. Barking Abbott, two hundred. Brentford, four hundred and thirty-two. In Uxbridge, one hundred and seventeen. In Hartford, ninety. In Ware, one hundred and sixty. In Hudson, thirty. In Waltham Abbey, twenty-three. In Epping, twenty-six. Deptford, six hundred and twenty-three. Greenwich, two hundred and thirty-one. Kingston, one hundred and twenty-two. Staines, eighty-two. Chertsey, eighteen. And in Windsor, one hundred and three. Cum Alis. Another thing might render the country more strict with respect to the citizens, and especially with respect to the poor, and this was what I hinted at before, namely, that there was a seeming propensity, or a wicked inclination, in those that were infected, to infect others. There have been great debates among our physicians as to the reason of this, some will have it to be in the nature of the disease, and that it impresses every one that is seized upon by it with a kind of a rage and a hatred against their own kind, as if there was a malignity not only in the distemper to communicate itself, but in the very nature of man, prompting him with evil will or an evil eye that, as they say in the case of a mad dog, who, though the gentlest creature before of any of his kind, yet then will fly upon and bite any one that comes next him, and those as soon as any who had been most observed by him before. Others placed it to the account of the corruption of human nature, who cannot bear to see itself more miserable than others of its own species, and has a kind of involuntary wish that all men were as unhappy, or in as bad a condition, as itself. Others say it was only a kind of desperation, not knowing or regarding what they did, and consequently unconcerned at the danger or safety not only of anybody near them, but even of themselves also. And indeed, when men are once come to a condition to abandon themselves, and be unconcerned for the safety, or at the danger of themselves, it cannot be so much wondered that they should be careless of the safety of other people. But I choose to give this grave debate a quite different turn, and answer it, or resolve it all by saying, that I do not grant the fact. On the contrary, I say that the thing is not really so, but that it was a general complaint raised by the people inhabiting the outlying villages against the citizens, to justify, or at least excuse, those hardships and severities so much talked of, and in which complaints both sides may be said to have injured one another, that is to say, the citizens pressing to be received and harboured in time of distress, and, with the plague upon them, complain of the cruelty and injustice of the country people in being refused entrance, and forced back again with their goods and families. And the inhabitants, finding themselves so imposed upon, and the citizens breaking in, as it were, upon them, whether they would or no, 
complained that when they were infected they were not only regardless of others but even willing to infect them neither of which were really true that is to say in the colours they were described in it is true there is something to be said for the frequent alarms which are given to the country of the resolution of the people of london to come out by force not only for relief but to plunder and rob that they ran about the streets with the distemper upon them without any control and that no care was taken to shut up houses and confine the sick people from infecting others whereas to do the londoners justice they never practise such things except in such particular cases as i have mentioned above and such like on the other hand everything was managed with so much care and such excellent order was observed in the whole city and suburbs by the care of the lord mayor and aldermen and by the justices of the peace church wardens etc in the out parts that london may be a pattern to all the cities in the world for the good government and the excellent order that was everywhere kept even in the time of the most violent infection and when the people were in the utmost consternation and distress but of this i shall speak by itself one thing it is to be observed was owing principally to the prudence of the magistrates and ought to be mentioned to their honour that is the moderation which they used in the great and difficult work of shutting up of houses it is true as i have mentioned that the shutting up of houses was a great subject of discontent and i may say indeed the only subject of discontent among the people at that time for the confining of the sound in the same house with the sick was counted very terrible and the complaints of people so confined were very grievous they were heard into the very streets and they were sometimes such that called for resentment though oftener for compassion they had no way to converse with any of their friends but out at their windows where they would make such piteous lamentations as often moved the hearts of those they talked with and of others who passing by heard their story and as those complaints oftentimes reproached the severity and sometimes the insolence of the watchmen placed at their doors those watchmen would answer saucily enough and perhaps be apt to affront the people who were in the street talking to the said families for which or for their ill-treatment of the families i think seven or eight of them in several places were killed i know not whether i should say murdered or not because i cannot enter into the particular cases it is true that the watchmen were on their duty and acting in the post where they were placed by a lawful authority and killing any public legal officer in the execution of his office is always in the language of the law called murder but as they were not authorized by the magistrates instructions or by the power they acted under to be injurious or abusive either to the people who were under their observation or to any that concerned themselves for them so when they did so they might be said to act themselves not their office to act as private persons not as persons employed and consequently if they brought mischief upon themselves by such an undue behaviour that mischief was upon their own heads and indeed they had so much the hearty curses of the people whether they deserved it or not that whatever befell them nobody pitied them and everybody was apt to say they deserved it whatever it was nor do i remember that anybody was ever punished at least to any considerable degree for whatever was done to the watchmen that guarded their houses 
what variety of stratagems were used to escape and get out of houses thus shut up by which the watchmen were deceived or overpowered and that the people got away i have taken notice of already and shall say no more to that but i say the magistrates did moderate and ease families upon many occasions in this case and particularly in that of taking away or suffering to be removed the sick persons out of such houses when they were willing to be removed either to a pest house or other places and sometimes giving the well persons in the family so shut up leave to remove upon information given that they were well and that they would confine themselves in such houses where they went so long as should be required of them the concern also of the magistrates for the supplying such poor families as were infected i say supplying them with necessaries as well physic as food was very great and in which they did not content themselves with giving the necessary orders to the officers appointed but the aldermen in person and on horseback frequently rode to such houses and caused the people to be asked at their windows whether they were duly attended or not also whether they wanted anything that was necessary and if the officers had constantly carried their messages and fetched them such things as they wanted or not and if they answered in the affirmative all was well but if they complained that they were ill-supplied, and that the officer did not do his duty, or did not treat them civilly, they, the officers, were generally removed, and others placed in their stead. It is true such complaint might be unjust, and if the officer had such arguments to use as would convince the magistrate that he was right, and that the people had injured him he was continued and they reproved but this part could not well bear a particular inquiry for the parties could very ill be well heard and answered in the street from the windows as was the case then the magistrates therefore generally chose to favour the people and remove the man as what seemed to be the least wrong and of the least ill consequence seeing if the watchman was injured yet they could easily make him amends by giving him another post of the like nature but if the family was injured there was no satisfaction could be made to them the damage perhaps being irreparable as it concerned their lives a great variety of these cases frequently happened between the watchmen and the poor people shut up besides those i formerly mentioned about escaping sometimes the watchmen were absent sometimes drunk sometimes asleep when the people wanted them and such never failed to be punished severely as indeed they deserved but after all that was or could be done in these cases the shutting up of houses so as to confine those that were well with those that were sick had very great inconveniences in it and some that were very tragical and which merited to have been considered if there had been room for it but it was authorized by a law it had the public good in view as the end chiefly aimed at and all the private injuries that were done by the putting it in execution must be put to the account of the public benefit it is doubtful to this day whether in the whole it contributed anything to the stop of the infection and indeed i cannot say it did for nothing could run with greater fury and rage than the infection did when it was in its chief violence though the houses infected were shut up as exactly and as effectually as it was possible certain it is that if all the infected persons were effectually shut in no sound person could have been infected by them 
because they could not have come near them. But the case was this, and I shall only touch it here, namely, that the infection was propagated insensibly, and by such persons as were not visibly infected, who neither knew whom they infected, or who they were infected by. A house in Whitechapel was shut up for the sake of one infected maid, who had only spots, not the tokens, come upon her, and recovered. Yet these people obtained no liberty to stir, neither for air or exercise, forty days. Want of breath, fear, anger, vexation, and all the other gifts attending such an injurious treatment, cast the mistress of the family into a fever, and visitors came into the house and said it was the plague, though the physicians declared it was not. However, the family were obliged to begin their quarantine anew on the report of the visitors or examiner, though their former quarantine wanted but a few days of being finished. This oppressed them so much with anger and grief, and, as before, straightened them also so much as to room, and for want of breathing and free air, that most of the family fell sick, one of one distemper, one of another, chiefly scorbutic ailments, only one a violent colic, till after several prolongings of their confinement, some or other of those that came in with the visitors to inspect the persons that were ill, in hopes of releasing them, brought the distemper with them, and infected the whole house, and all or most of them died, not of the plague, as really upon them before, but of the plague that those people brought them, who should have been careful to have protected them from it and this was a thing which frequently happened, and was indeed one of the worst consequences of shutting houses up. I had at this time a little hardship put upon me, which I was at first greatly afflicted at, and very much disturbed about, though, as it proved, it did not expose me to any disaster, and this was being appointed by the alderman of the Potsoken ward, one of the examiners of the houses in the precinct where I lived. We had a large parish, and had no less than eighteen examiners, as the order called us. The people called us visitors. I endeavoured with all my might to be excused from such an employment, and used many arguments with the alderman's deputy to be excused, particularly I alleged that I was against shutting up houses at all, and that it would be very hard to oblige me to be an instrument in that which was against my judgment, and which I did not verily believe would answer the end it was intended for. But all the abatement I could get was only that, whereas the officer was appointed by my Lord Mayor to continue two months, I should be obliged to hold it but three weeks, on condition, nevertheless, that I could then get some other sufficient housekeeper to serve the rest of the time for me, which was, in short, but a very small favour, it being very difficult to get any man to accept of such an employment that was fit to be entrusted with it. It is true that shutting up of houses had one effect, which I am sensible was of moment, namely, it confined the distempered people, who would otherwise have been both very troublesome and very dangerous in their running about streets with the distemper upon them, which, when they were delirious, they would have done in a most frightful manner, and as indeed they began to do at first very much, till they were thus restrained. Nay, so very open they were that the poor would go about and beg at people's doors, and say they had the plague upon them, and beg rags for their sores, or both, or anything that delirious nature happened to think of. 
a poor unhappy gentlewoman a substantial citizen's wife was if the story be true murdered by one of these creatures in aldersgate street or that way he was going along the street raving mad to be sure and singing the people only said he was drunk but he himself said he had the plague upon him which it seems was true and meeting this gentlewoman he would kiss her she was terribly frighted as he was only a rude fellow and she ran from him but the street being very thin of people there was nobody near enough to help her when she saw he would overtake her she turned and gave him a thrust so forcibly he being but weak and pushed him down backward but very unhappily she being so near he caught hold of her and pulled her down also and getting up first mastered her and kissed her and which was worst of all when he had done told her he had the plague and why should not she have it as well as he she was frighted enough before being also young with child but when she heard him say he had the plague she screamed out and fell down into a swoon or in a fit which though she recovered a little yet killed her in a very few days and i never heard whether she had the plague or no another infected person came and knocked at the door of a citizen's house where they knew him very well the servant let him in and being told the master of the house was above he ran up and came into the room to them as the whole family was at supper they began to rise up a little surprised not knowing what the matter was but he bid them sit still he only came to take his leave of them they asked him why mr blank where are you going going says he i have got the sickness and shall die to-morrow night tis easy to believe though not to describe the consternation they were all in the women and the man's daughters which were but little girls were frighted almost to death and got up one running out at one door and one at another some downstairs and some upstairs and getting together as well as they could locked themselves into their chambers and screamed out at the window for help as if they had been frighted out of their wits the master more composed than they though both frighted and provoked was going to lay hands on him and throw him downstairs being in a passion but then considering a little the condition of the man and the danger of touching him horror seized his mind and he stood still like one astonished the poor distempered man all this while being as well diseased in his brain as in his body stood still like one amazed at length he turns around ay says he with all the seeming calmness imaginable is it so with you all are you all disturbed at me why then i'll e'en go home and die there and so he goes immediately downstairs the servant that had let him in goes down after him with a candle but was afraid to go past him and open the door so he stood on the stairs to see what he would do the man went and opened the door and went out and flung the door after him it was some while before the family recovered the fright but as no ill consequence attended they have had occasion since to speak of it you may be sure with great satisfaction though the man was gone it was some time nay as i heard some days before they recovered themselves of the hurry they were in nor did they go up and down the house with any assurance till they had burnt a great variety of fumes and perfumes in all the rooms and made a great many smokes of pitch 
of gunpowder and of sulphur, all separately shifted, and washed their clothes and the like. As to the poor man, whether he lived or died, I don't remember. It is most certain that, if by shutting up of the houses the sick had not been confined, multitudes, who in the height of their fever were delirious and distracted, would have been continually running up and down the streets, and even as it was, a very great number did so, and offered all sorts of violence to those they met, even just as a mad dog runs on and bites at every one he meets. Nor can I doubt but that, should one of those infected, diseased creatures have bitten any man or woman, while the frenzy of the distemper was upon them, they, I mean the person so wounded, would as certainly have been incurably infected as one that was sick before, and had the tokens upon him. I heard of one infected creature, who, running out of his bed in his shirt, in the anguish and agony of his swellings, of which he had three upon him, got his shoes on, and went to put on his coat, but the nurse, resisting, and snatching the coat from him, he threw her down, ran over her, ran downstairs and into the street, directly to the Thames, in his shirt, the nurse running after him, and calling to the watch to stop him. But the watchman, frighted at the man, and afraid to touch him, let him go on, upon which he ran down to the still-yard stairs, threw away his shirt, and plunged into the Thames, and, being a good swimmer, swam quite over the river, and the tide being coming in, as they call it, that is running westward, he reached the land, not till he came about the falcon stairs, where, landing, and finding no people there, it being in the night, he ran about the streets there, naked as he was, for a good while, when, it being by that time high water, he takes the river again, and swam back to the still-yard, and landed, ran up the streets again to his own house, knocking at the door, went up the stairs, and into his bed again, and that this terrible experiment cured him of the plague, that is to say, that the violent motion of his arms and legs stretched the parts where the swellings he had upon him were, that is to say, under his arms and his groin, and caused them to ripen and break, and that the cold of the water abated the fever in his blood. I have only to add that I do not relate this any more than some of the other, as a fact within my own knowledge, so as that I can vouch the truth of them, and especially that of the man being cured by the extravagant adventure which I confess I do not think very possible, but it may serve to confirm that many desperate things which the distressed people, falling into deliriums, and what we call light-headedness, were frequently run upon at that time, and how infinitely more such there would have been if such people had not been confined by the shutting up of houses, and this I take to be the best if not the only good thing which was performed by that severe method. On the other hand, the complaints and the murmurings were very bitter against the thing itself. It would pierce the hearts of all that came by to hear the piteous cries of those infected people, who, being thus out of their understandings by the violence of their pain or the heat of their blood, were either shut in, or perhaps tied in their beds and chairs, to prevent their doing themselves hurt, and who would make a dreadful outcry at their being confined, and at their being not permitted to die at large, as they called it, and as they would have done before. End of section 16